after my 30th birthday, I literally checked myself in somewhere for 28 days and wow. I went to deal with trauma and anxiety and depression and all of those things that people are like, oh, she must have gone in for like it, something, like an eating disorder, drugs, whatever it was. I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is just as serious. Welcome everyone back to the School of Greatest podcast. We have the lovely Leanne Rhymes in the house. Good to see you. Nice I'm so see pumped you're here. I'm so happy I'm here. I'm so grateful. We've been working on this for like almost two years. I, feel I know like. it has been crazy. First <laughs> off, I was like, "Who is this dude?" And then I've totally fell in love with you. Oh, what do you do? Thank you. And then we met for lunch, which was so great. Yeah. And it's just good to get to know you. Yeah, it's been you're great. You're good people. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Anything you need, I got your back. Thank you. You're constantly traveling and touring and. You're in Vancouver, you're in LA, you're doing movies, you're doing music, you're t all that stuff. So you're a busy individual and you've had a busy life. I've had a busy life, yeah. When you were 12, 13, you kind of came on the scene yeah. and became like a superstar in the country music world, Billboard top charts, you know, yeah. all these different awards in your teens. Yeah. I think I read over 30 something, 37 million records worldwide sold. <laughs> Billboard, kept up with it. Billboard ranked top 17 artists of the decade from 1990 to 2000. I mean, oh. you just done. Did you read that one? Didn't know that. It's pretty cool, huh? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so many things that you've created, but we were just talking about this before, is that there's also been a lot of struggles you've faced in the last 20 plus years of your shiny career. Right, yeah. And um, what would you say has been the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in the last? 20 years while everyone is praising and all this success and millions of records and top artists in the world but what's been the biggest challenge well the first thing that comes to mind since i mean i can be really honest here um my ego um and because i started so young i mean an ego first off is we all have to have it to to live and be human um but there's a healthy way of yeah. being in that and also a very unhealthy way and um I guess when I talk about it, it's I started so young that, and I'm in a business where I have to care how much what people think and you know how many people are buying my albums and how many are coming to the shows and the whole deal. So it's a it's a very people pleasing kind of yeah. way of being, um, and especially when you start that young, that's all I knew. So having to, and I still do this daily. It's like having to disengage um, with trying to please everyone and be everything to everyone and make everybody happy. Um, it's like, what ultimately like do I want? Like, how, what do mm. I feel? Um, and I started so young that I naturally had that. Like, I naturally knew what I wanted. And when you're, you know, my first song that I recorded, I was 11. That actually ended up coming out when I was 13. But at 11 you're still so creative and there's like no boundaries and you're just creating from your heart. And I, I had that, this just magic about me at that age. And then you start to lose that when so many people get in your ear and then you're trying to keep up with the success that you've had. And there's so many levels to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess when I talk about ego, it's really from that space of having <clears throat> to allow like the Leanne Rhymes that was created to kind of fall away to figure out who like, the real Leanne Rams is mm. to continue to move forward. Wow. So. Do you feel like you had to kind of destroy yourself at one totally. point? Totally. <laughs> to then say, okay, totally. everyone's built this up, this yeah. like image of you. Yeah, and you do it. I did it so, like, I was so unconscious of the fact that I was doing it. That you were um, destroying yourself? That I was destroying it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I needed to. Like, I really needed to figure out who I was without all of the hoopla, you know, yeah. around me and what people's expectations and it it was a it um I did it just enough you know I did it just yeah. enough so I still I mean I've always I've had a great career and I've had so many fantastic fans I've been in this business for so long people still care like it's kind of crazy because <laughs> most people don't have that and mm -hmm. um but I did it enough so I could I don't know so I could find well, I found my humanity again. Like there was just this piece of me that never got to be human. Really? Um, you know, there was somebody you, you put you up on a pedestal from the time you're a kid, and it's like you can't don't do anything fall. wrong, you right? Can't, yeah, don't yeah. fall. 
Um, so I guess, I mean, in a way, there was it was it was kind of inevitable that yeah. something like that was going to happen. Did you feel like you were unconsciously sabotaging things? Like yeah. In your early twenties, or you just like started sabotaging a lot of things? I just started doing it out of sheer, you know. Um, rebellion in a way but I, it wasn't a bad thing I don't think necessarily like I needed to I needed to find all I needed to find all of these pieces of me that I felt had been fragmented mm-hmm. and kind of pushed to the side um to be Leanne Rhymes, right. you know so um yeah my the journey of it all was really inevitable and I honestly I think my greatest accomplishment is that I'm still alive and I'm still standing really yeah do you feel I like mean, at one point you almost we're gonna die or something? Well, I, I don't know. I started so young. I never felt like I'd live past twenty-one for some no reason. No way. Yeah, it was like a weird thing. Um, and then I didn't think I'd live past thirty. It was like always. And now I feel like I'm gonna live for a really long okay. time. Okay. <laughs> good. good. No, but I, I don't know. I think starting so young, you just like had this. I just had this weird feeling about me that I, with all the craziness around me and I never really had anonymity it was always like everyone was always in my face in your business and you knew everything about you yeah. relationships or, everything yeah I mean there was like nothing that could be hidden um, this was pre-social media this was pre-social media which is crazy to think about uh, but I I think about people in my position that started so young and most of them are not here anymore and I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I feel like is an accomplishment is I've actually worked through some really dark days. Um, and I pretty much, there's a rare day where I feel like I don't have myself, but that's very few and far between anymore. Where I know that it can get really, really dark and I'm gonna be okay. Like, so you know like, okay, I'm going through a lot of stuff right now, yeah. but I'm gonna get out on the other side. Okay. Yeah, there is, an, there is another side. But there was a time where you thought yeah. like, there's no way out. Yeah, there was a lot of pain. I mean, I went through, you know, a divorce publicly with my with my mom and dad. It was they were fourteen when I divorced. We were right in the middle of like when they divorced or you when they divorced. Di- when they divorced. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sorry, when they got a divorce. Um, and then I went through a lawsuit with my dad publicly, and then I went through a lawsuit with my record label. Like all of these things. Um, eventually, like what I've learned about the body and the nervous system and the whole deal is my nervous system was just like on stun all the time. So it was constantly in fight or flight. So much adrenaline constantly. So much. Um, That's not healthy. No, and only over the past like three years have I really been able to understand that. And calm down. And like, yeah. Really? (laughs) And calm down, yeah. The anxiety and the things that were stored in my body and the pain and then like. The trauma though. Trauma, it was all trauma. and, And to know that I think I was afraid to go into it. You know, I mean, they, they always say, like, the only way out is through. So I knew I had to go through it, but I was so afraid because I'd been avoiding it for, like, for so long. When did you start to, to go through it? The trauma, the pain, the Ooh. suffering? What, how old were you then? Well, I know I was, I mean, I was in my early teens when, or my mid-teens, when I started to feel the pain of it all. Um, but I would push it away in every way that I possibly could. Like and work. Went through. I would work. Um... Did you ever do I, drugs or drinking or? I had my world? moments of here and there of different things, but it wasn't like. I was I was one of those kids. Thank God there was no social media around. I was one of those kids that like, I would bring the party to me. We would be in the house. It would be super safe, safe. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> it was safe in my sixteen year old mind, like woo. Um, but yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't ever one to like get so dark into that. It was more of emotionally just kind of like disengaging. I closed myself off like big time. From the world um, or from, from friends, from parents, from, from everything. From what age, what ages? Like I started definitely around 17. Gosh. Yeah, it was just a protection mechanism. Was it know? just because everyone was trying to get something from you or they were manipulating you or they were taking advantage or what was the it feeling? It was always like a, I think it was a constant like grabbing like needing something feeding off of you know who I was wow. and at the time um, and you just yeah I, I think back then and I just there was just a lot of pain this kid was going through like I see it such a different place now you can really witness it from yeah. a different side and this kid was in a lot of pain um, and so there was there was definitely a moment where I'm like if I go into that like I'm really afraid I'm not coming out of it 
when you dive in into it. The like trauma if I allow pain. that, yeah, to feel that, I'm just I'm afraid it's gonna like overtake me and I won't be able to come out of it. And you were like 17 when that started. Or? 17, 18, yeah. I mean, it really kind of culminated like to, when I was 30. I just decided um, I had actually gone through a lot of it's a long story, but long story short, I'd gone through a lot of um, dental surgeries. Um, and I had been put under many times and I wasn't, I was just not, not, it was not fun. 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 (laughs) It's not fun. And it starts to mess with all of you. And I hadn't really dealt with the whole nervous system thing. And I hadn't dealt with the trauma in my body and it just like, everything just kind of went. And finally I was like, I need, I want to, I want to check myself in somewhere. Like no one needs to. And and I was terrified to do it. I'd never been alone before. There's always someone around me. And after my 30th birthday, um, I think it was the day after, actually, or two days after, I literally checked myself in somewhere for 28 days. And wow. I went to deal with trauma and anxiety and depression and all of those things that people are like, oh, she must have gone in for like it, something, like an eating disorder, drugs, whatever it was. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is just as serious. Like, anxiety and, and depression are, you know, things that people you know a lot of people deal with we don't talk about enough yeah. and it's it is enough at some point to, <sighs> to kill ask, you yes to kill you yeah. <laughs> it is to harm you yeah. to cause a heart attack a stroke totally. or whatever so it was a uh, so you checked yourself into yes. a facility somewhere here in LA or yeah. near here did someone inspire you to do this like a friend of yours who had gone through something that came out on the other side and you saw a transformation or? no um my husband and my friends at the time, they were just super worried about me because they saw I was on a lot of medication at the time wow. and I was going through just like I said, being put under a lot. And they were like, look, you need can, can we help you get some to help you find some sanity in all of this? Um, and I was more than willing to. So it was just wow. a simple conversation that was had. And I was terrified when I went in. I'm like, I've never been alone. What's going to happen? Without your phone, without this. Something, yeah. yeah. And, uh, wow. you know, I was, I just had such great support. And I think that that's, when I finally had the right support system in place um, in my life, it allowed me to kind of just like surrender into feel safer, feeling these things. Feel like yeah. People aren't going to take advantage of you or whatever. Yeah. Know. Wow. So what was the greatest lesson you learned? And so you were 30 when you went in. Mm-hmm. What was the greatest lesson you learned from that 28-day experience? Oh, wow. Um, I guess <laughs> that I, I was like, wow, I'm not as... I thought I, was, I thought I was pretty messed up when I went in, and I realized after I started sifting through everything, I'm like, you know, this is not so abnormal. I was around other people that were going through similar situations, if not worse than I was at the time, and I was like, this is not... I don't feel so alone anymore. Yeah. And then you realize outside of like the six or seven people that were with you, then you start talking about it publicly. And then you realize how alone you really aren't. Like, Because everyone so starts reaching people. out to you and yeah. saying, I feel this way. Oh, right? yeah. I've been through it. And that was the beginning of realizing that I could connect through humanity and not just like through this voice wow. of this like, you know, child that everybody looked up to. Um, there became a different voice that I found. Do you feel like that yes. was the moment you were able to kind of process all this stuff from childhood and actually start to grow up yeah really yeah totally totally and i still i still go through my days when i there's a real um line for me where i feel like a woman and where i i can tell i'm slipping back into like a child's space yeah um awareness is an amazing thing self-awareness is an incredible incredible tool that a lot of us just want to run from i mean i did for so long it's not fun sometimes it's not fun but what I've actually made it fun. I've actually I've started to like finding out these like strange, quirky, like odd things about myself. I'm like, oh, so that's what's running me in this situation, uh, because then it becomes for me now. It's become like this. I've been I've become obsessed with like the how do I not override it and not get rid of it. It's more like how do I how do I heal it? Mm. I mean, because when we what start, it, what's it? The conversation you have, or it can be anything. It can be yeah. It can be. The story that I'm telling myself, it can be um, the all of a sudden that something that's completely in my subconscious becomes conscious, and I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Like that's why I'm, you know, uh, sabotaging myself in this area or that area, and it becomes it, it's interesting to me now. Like yeah. I find it all fascinating that we actually can change that. Mm-hmm. That's what's so amazing is we actually have the choice to do that, and I know people talk about that all the time, and it sounds 
so simple and it is and it isn't but um when it takes you, work it, it takes, takes practice. work but it also is as simple as choosing but then it's deciding deciding that's it. yeah what was the i feel like you have a fascinating mind <laughs> i feel like well, i feel like you've been through so much again mm -hmm. at someone at like 12 13 18 having that type of uh acknowledgement and awareness and hype and you know mm -hmm. all for good reason but like having that at such a young age I can only imagine what conversations you might be having both positive oh, right. and negative like what's <laughs> in your mind and yeah and I'm curious what were the stories or the things that your mind told you uh -huh. that supported your journey and what were the the conversations that that, that made you suffer what were both of those? Because That's both a really of them, good both of them, you know, because the positive stuff continued your rise and continued to be successful in your career, but the negative stuff probably held you back in certain ways as well. Oh yeah, so I'm completely. Curious, I'm curious, what are both those conversations that your mind had? Um, Whether you were conscious or unconscious about it. Oh my God, we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> um, no, uh, so. I remember, I'll give you bits and pieces that yeah. are popping up in my head. So I remember my dad um, constantly telling me like I could do anything I wanted to do. Uh, That's nice. Yeah, it was. He was always, you know, you're the best and you're, and wow. I was, I was, I was different than most kids my age. You know, you heard kids sing that were my age and it was very, very different. It was very amateur, young. It was very different. And so I believed that this one side of myself was like the best and it, clearly paid off, I mean, with that belief. But it was also a belief that was was uh, kind of bred into me by my dad. It wasn't my own self-belief is what I was realized. It, outside it was belief. outside belief. Interesting. And so when my dad and I went through all of our stuff, it was almost like I felt like I couldn't do it without him. Wow, because he was the one instilling the belief in you. Totally. So and you'd kind of divorce your dad, it sounded like. Yeah, right? in, a, in a way, yes. I mean, and so I didn't have him around in my life like that, telling me constantly, like, you can do this. Like, it was, it was an outside, you know, right. voice. So did you, did you not have that belief anymore? For, no, I take that back. I did have that belief, um, but it was... It came from an unhealthy place, I think. It wasn't like I I believed deep down in myself, I loved myself, and I could I could make a mistake and still have that belief. You know, I would I would go through um, I was I've always been super hard on myself. My dad yeah. was I mean, I have to say my my dad instilled some amazing things in me and also there was a work ethic that I yeah. think there's always a fine Tough line. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. always a fine line to um, to all of those things, uh, but I. Yeah. Where where did it come from the the outside belief? If it wasn't from your dad, was it like a relationship it was, or the media or? Oh, outside everything. It was people. If it wasn't my dad, it was like how many people were interested in what I was doing and my music and the whole deal. How many records did it sell? Right. And this, exactly. It was numbers. always numbers and the whole thing. And um, it it's still it's I'm still on the journey of like literally finding the inner voice that is kind, that allows me to be human, that makes mistakes, that um, I think I'm approaching things, like I used to approach my performances from a very perfectionistic kind of place of like every note had to be right and I've gone through a journey of hmm. knowing that that's there but now it's like how do I express and how do I like how do I show up in love and like how do I show up with my heart open and when you start, for me, now that I've started coming from a different place, that perfectionistic side of things, like kind of, it gets softer. Yeah. You know, I'm it's, showing up for different reasons. I'm not showing up to prove myself in any way, um, which I think as a kid, like you're constantly competing, you know, you're competing with outside world. You're competing with the last number of records you sold. And for me now, it's like, how can I, I mean, we always, you know, say how you're competing with yourself, but it's true. Yeah. Like when you, that finally clicks and you actually embody that, it's, the outside, you start here first and the outside starts to come into play instead of looking at the outside to validate the inside. What mm -hmm. age were you when you started to believe in yourself on the inside and realize like, oh, I don't need my dad or Can I numbers. say like three years ago? <laughs> no joke, like three or four wow. years ago, I would start to say that I've, I started to realize like, 
So all your 20s, you still didn't believe in yourself on the I inside. believed, but like there was you always... needed other people. Yeah, they needed yeah. the outside validation. And there was always, like I grew up with, um, I grew up with psoriasis really bad all over my body um, from the time I was super young. And so that being into play mm. also played into my self-esteem. Your insecurities. And, and then having my face out in front of everyone uh, in the world and, you know, knowing that I was always hiding this piece of me and... Um, was, was, it, always, was it on your face or it wasn't your on back? My face. It was on your it was back and your stomach. Everywhere, and like, yeah. I dated someone many years ago who had, she was beautiful and so kind, but she had it all over her mm-hmm. chest and her stomach and That's her miserable. back. And it would come and go like every couple of weeks mm-hmm. when she would have anxiety and stress. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I just, there was nothing I could do to support her besides be there for her. But it's hard. I can only imagine how hard yeah. it is, like, having this on your body. And, and still loving yourself and still feeling right. like well, I'm, that I'm beautiful happen. and I'm this. That didn't and, happen. <laughs> that and then you just beat yourself happen. up and you cause more stress totally. and create more psoriasis. Totally. Right? It's just such a cyclical thing. Um, but yeah, that, there was also that that played into it. So it was, I had this one thing that I put so much, um, it, that was the one thing that could validate me as a human. Your voice. Yeah. It was your identity. Voice. It was everything. And what happens if you don't have that anymore? Right. Well, so I've gone through moments in my life where I've lost my voice or had to cancel shows or whatever because of, um, because I've lost my voice, you know, and didn't have one. And it was, it is the most terrifying thing. Now, it's a little different when I do lose my voice. I still go through the stress of it, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to chill. It's telling me something like I need to go basically sit down, shut up, go chill out. Like, you know, it's. I've noticed that my voice, when I lose it, it has nothing to do really with like overusing it. It has to do with probably underusing it. It has to do with me not actually. Like, there's something Practicing. that's not coming out oh, emotionally. Emotionally. Wow, really? Yeah. When you lose it. Yeah, you it's feel definitely like, an emotional thing. It's like you're holding on to something. Yeah. You're not saying what you need to say. Totally. You're f- afraid to say something. Totally. Or, wow. Yeah. Well, and you grow up. You know, growing up in this business, like, you know, I would be told like don't don't have an opinion about certain things you don't want to you know don't want to don't state your views politically don't state your views this way because people won't buy your records and so from early on I was like oh I have to hide like all of these things whether it be my skin my opinion there's I mean there's a lot of layers to that too of like how that you know affects you especially starting out so young so I've kind of had to peel away like all of these layers of decades of trauma Decades of trauma and decades of programming from outside programming. So So now I'm reprogramming myself most of the time. And so this has been the last three year journey. Yeah, three, four years. Three, four years. Since you did this 28 day therapy, you know, time that you had for yourself, you've been reprogramming. What are the things that you're saying to yourself through this reprogramming? Is there certain things you say like in the morning or throughout the day or in a moment of doubt? Do you flip it and say something else to your to yourself? How does that work? Well, I have I have come to learn that we really operate out of two places, and that is love and fear. Mm-hmm. And the fear's a lie. And so every time something like this comes up, it's just I I really recognize it as old programming. It's like mm-hmm. oh, that's just that piece that's old. I don't have to believe that anymore. Yeah. Um, and. I also, like, I spend time with myself. Um, I know this sounds crazy, but I literally, like, spend time with myself sometimes, like, touching every part of my body and telling it I love it. Wow. Um, I don't think that's crazy. That. I think that's beautiful. And feeling it. Like, sorry, I'm just going to, like, totally screw with the mic. Um, but <clears throat> fe- actually feeling it. I think that's the one piece that I've learned, you know, listening to Joe Dispenza and, like, all yeah. these different people who are fantastic. The one piece that we leave out is the actual, like, body this uh, somatic experience of the feeling of what we're what we're going through in our mind the all of the in, whether it be affirmations or whatever we're doing meditation um, when we can feel that and actually like feel the love that we have for ourselves it changes everything and I I can't always call on it it's not like we were talking earlier it's not like I figured it all out right I have a you long haven't way arrived to go. Yet? Come on. No. Come on, a long end. way to go I don't think that ever happens um, but I, that's been the new piece for me is like to really wake up every morning. I wake up and I, I, I read somewhere like people who like wake up and like literally stretch and like with our arms out into the world, like they, it starts our day in like a completely different way. So I've I started doing that and I, 
I have a meditation practice I usually do for an hour a day. And an hour? Hour to an hour and a half, yeah. Wow. I try to get it in. Uh, yeah. That's it's, impressive. It. I love it. I've fallen in love with it. It's just my, it becomes my time. Mm. I think when I've, my time has always been given away. Now you're, and so it's you're like taking, taking it a piece of it back, yeah. So you have, you have feeling time where you feel your body do, yes. and you, you embrace and love every inch of your body. I think it's a beautiful practice for, especially people that are insecure. Yeah. Or the people that don't think they're pretty, who are like the most beautiful human beings alive. Totally. And it's amazing how we all see ourselves. So opposite of like yeah. what everyone else, how everyone else sees us. Right. But I, um, so I was on uh, this biologic drug for my psoriasis for like 12 years. And it would like a steroid type of drug. It was a um, it was a it's a, not a steroid, a but it's um, no, it's an injection that I would would block certain uh, certain things from developing, basically mm. certain antibodies. But um, I it would lower my immune system, and I accidentally stumbled off of it. I, I would like stretch out for you know however many weeks I could before I saw something, and then I'd take it. Uh -huh. So I realized I was like four months off of it. I'm like, well. And you weren't having nothing. A... I'm like, let's just see. I was actually in a great mental space, and mm. you know, now I was usually I would freak out. And I'm like, I can't get off of this. I can't do it. And I was just in a place where I'm like, you know what? Let's just see. And so I've been off of it for about a year, and it's right, good. Yeah, I like and it. I'll have places that come up, and I'll, and I'll use like topical stuff. But yeah. the one thing that I've learned is if I Whatever, whatever arises, whatever it's an emotion, or it's psoriasis, or it's a few pounds, whatever it is, if I can just sit with it and be like, okay, I see you, you're there, and allow it to be for a moment, and then literally I, I will sit with my psoriasis and put my hands on it and be like, I love you, it's cool, wow. you can hang out for a while if you want. Like, And once you really start meaning that, like. It changes, it changes everything. Anxiety, when I get anxiety, I'll literally go, okay, you're here again, how's it going? And just allow it to be for a moment. And it literally, within, within minutes, starts to completely shift. I mean, mm. I'll wake up the next morning after I've done that with my psoriasis and it'll be gone. So, yeah, as opposed to resisting it, it's yeah. allowing and acknowledging it and saying, It's trying to tell you something. It's, it's okay. Let me, let me be mindful of like, why am I stressed out? Right. Why am I anxious? Let me sit with it and then let it go. Yeah. And come and go and breathe through it, right? Totally. When did you start to learn about, you know, accepting these challenges that you're facing emotionally or physically and falling in love with them as opposed to rejecting them? Yeah. Um, and the falling in love with them, once you start shifting that perception, um, yeah, you start becoming whole. You start feeling whole, which is mm -hmm. so beautiful. Um, and you I accept yourself, all of you. All of you. And you realize that those are actually, and I know it's so hard to do this when it's popping up in your life, that those are gifts. Like, those are true gifts that are leading you down one way or the other, like yeah. leading you away from something or leading you towards something. And sometimes our deepest fears and um, pain and trauma is really, we've experienced it to share. We've experienced it to help people. I mean, we talk about a life of service and yeah. it's, what better way to be of service than to share the darkest moments that mm -hmm. you've been through because you're so not the only one that's done it. So um, I actually about, I guess it was probably about four years ago, I started working with um, a breathwork teacher named Ashley Neese who is incredible here in LA or? she's in LA well yeah. she's actually um in Oakland now but she lived here in LA at the time and um this is before the uh the 28 day no this was after okay. so I'm 36 now so I checked yeah, when I was 30 so we went through a couple years with like just still kind of like trying to figure out what yeah. the hell's going on you didn't really have a practice it's no like. I didn't um and I was on Instagram and I was looking on um, Cameron Diaz's the body book thing mm -hmm. and I um found Ashley and then she started popping up randomly. Thank God for like the Instagram. Uh, what's the <laughs> what's the, yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> the uh, algorithm. It yeah, like yeah. it threw up in my in my face all the time. And um, it was about five months into it, and I was like, you know what? I know this is crazy. I've never contacted anyone on Instagram, but I'm going to. And something just told me to call her. And my assistant set up a time with her, and I go, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing. Um, and she literally, from the moment I sat down with her, she started teaching me breath work and 
she's, I swear, like, my therapist at the same time, but she, there was a, such a spiritual aspect to it. I'd gone through so much therapy that I, I was sick of talking about yeah. everything. I didn't, and I wasn't shifting anything. You were still, like, in the same conversation. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't want to have that anymore. And so she helped me shift out of that and to really work through the trauma in my body. She did a lot of somatic work, and um, I was always here and never here. Constantly, I mean, obviously, there were so many reasons why I constantly wanted to run away from my body. So my practice has been literally coming back into myself. Wow, dropping into your heart, totally. dropping into your body, yeah. Dropping into every piece of me. And um, fear, this is where fear lives. The anxiety, yeah. stress, overwhelm, totally. worry, it's like up in your head, it's like the story. And then when we drop into our hearts, we get back to love. Completely. We get grounded. Yes, and that's such a huge piece. And gratitude, I know people talk about like, Oh, make your gratitude list. Um, she was one that really finally got me into that. The key. It is so it is the key. key. It's you so can't simple. be grateful and angry at the same totally. time or stressed. And why can't we? Why is it the simplest of things so that can we not get into our heads? Because people, I think we all want to think it's super complicated. No. And breath, like deep breaths. <sighs> deep breaths and gratitude are like the two the things I keep coming back to are, are love it comes back to the heart and gratitude for everything going back to gratitude for even the quote unquote what we label negative pieces yeah. showing up what how can I be grateful for the totality of it all wow. um, yeah I, I'll, I'll get I'll get away from my practice every once in a while and the first thing that I I constantly like my intuition just brings me back to like where's your heart and where's the love and where how can I wake up and and get into that space every morning because once you get in that space like the whole world changes if you wake up in reaction mode and anxiety yes. mode it's hard to get out of that for the rest of the day it's like you kind of stay in that unless you, you break the system and take right. an hour break and breathe and meditate or mm -hmm. do a, a gratitude practice but that's why i think it's important to do it first thing totally. i do it first thing and then last thing at night oh like nice my girlfriend and i will talk about what we're grateful for from the day oh i love that and it just allows me to like just sleep you know i'm just like uh, mm -hmm. you know it's like you live in gratitude at night it's like okay i feel at peace as opposed to I used to always be anxious at night. Mm -hmm. It would take me hours to fall asleep. So I was always living in anxiety and fear and like insecurity. But yes. When I said like, well, here's what I'm grateful for. Even the smallest things, it brought me a lot more peace. Mm -hmm. But that's powerful. So you do about an hour of breathing meditation in the morning. Yeah, I do. Um, some I just stretching, started, some opening ups. I do. I um. I, I'm one of those people that still reaches for my phone, I have to say. That's like, tough. Yeah. It's Who so doesn't? hard. Who doesn't? Um, yeah. Unless you're a monk. I know, right? I try not to. Um, but I'll go down and have coffee with my husband in the morning, and then um, I'll go in, in my little meditation room that I have at the house. And um, I've been doing Joe's. Dispenser? Yeah, yeah. I've been did doing, you guys connect? I mean, we did connect. I love him. You guys He's got super on the phone sweet. We did get on the phone. Um, we're going to, I want to dig into some further stuff. He's amazing, stuff isn't he? He is amazing. And yeah. I have a zillion questions. <laughs> <laughs> that episode we did with him, it's just been like blowing up. And so uh, many people have read his book and are using the meditation. It is incredible. And, uh, really great. is. Um, so I've been actually doing his meditation. Um, They're powerful. Yeah, for like 30, 45 minutes in the morning. And then I'll, I've been chanting, actually. So I have I was doing some chanting for a while. And I kind of got away from it. I was doing some kundalini yoga. Mm -hmm. And just stepped away from it and a friend of mine the other day was talking to me about the power of my voice and she was saying that you don't use your sound current for yourself. Right, you share. Right, you use it and it's always projected out but she's like, wow. you know, moving energy, that's one of your greatest tools to move energy is through your voice. And a lot of the time when I sing it's very, it's always structured, you know, I don't, I don't allow myself this is one of the, the new uh, loving things that you're I do allowing myself. yourself to do now. Allowing myself, yes. I mean, it's it's taking that voice of you have to be perfect and you have to oh you know you can't you can't wade through the crap to like get to the pretty piece. Like I need to be able to sit in stuff that doesn't sound good or whatever it mm -hmm. is to get to to get to the gift underneath. I mean, that's such a life lesson. But for me, playing around with it with my voice of just allowing sound to come out um, 
and sometimes I'll keep my phone by me because sometimes something really good will come out. And I'm like, wait, Ooh, that was really good. That, yeah. <laughs> wait, I'm going to write a song off what, of that. So what is this chanting like? You're just um, making stuff up? Can, no. So, I mean, I'll... Can you I'll, demonstrate I'll, a little five seconds of what a chant is? Yes. So um, what <laughs> chant am I doing right now? Um, um, yes. Yeah, so I do this one chant for... Um, it's for protection and projection. It's a kundalini um, meditation. But it's... Um, Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> Excited. I know. My husband said the other day, my husband's like, I want you, to, I'm like, I want you to chant with me. And he's like, no, I just want to hear you chant. Um, I'll chant and, with you yeah, if you want. Okay, no. So, so he, who was, but it was really sweet because he was like, really, I just love to hear you chant. Oh, wow. And um, so he sat with me as the first time I ever chanted in front of someone. That was like two days ago. Wow. So, okay. Hold on, so you, you got practice so, now. Yes. So, um, so usually... We, I would do this, and it, my my arms move with everything. So it's um, ah, uh, you got good in a me, sad good in a me, siri guru deva in a me. There you go. Wow. <laughs> and so yeah, all right. I don't know so, if you're supposed to clap yes, after a chant, yes, but I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> No, but I wow, do. Wow, that's beautiful, uh, though. Thanks, and I do like that's a very like a like I said for protection and projection, and it's an open heart wow. kind of yeah. thing. So I try to get into my heart as much as possible. Um, so I do that in the morning, and yeah, it's a new thing. Imagining, imagine knowing your voice for as long as I have, and I'm like, oh wait, there's this other piece, there's this other like uh, level to mm, the gift that like, you can unwrap. access. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should do like. A weekly chant session for people at your house or at a studio. Like oh I, I know the meditation studio owner Susie over uh, over here. If you want to like do it, I'm oh sure. Oh my god, I would can, love to. They have like the bowls, they have the room, they have the whole setup. Like so, this is my new thing. It'd be so amazing. I want to learn like the whole. Shindig. Oh my gosh, can you imagine like <laughs> chanting like... with Leanne Rhymes? It'd be like so incredible. Fun. I'd be there. But see, I want. That's the thing too. Is like I love my sweet husband. He's like I want to hear you, and that's wonderful. But I want. I want people to find that sound current in them because, mm. you know, when you when I'm doing this, like when I come back to my heart, when I'm when there's it's vibrating, like we can you I can feel, feel it, it when you're speaking, but when you're singing, no, it's electric. It is. It's it's powerful. It's powerful. It's but healing. People, ha everybody has that in them, and that's what I we're so focused on what everything sounds like or what things look like, and I think part of my journey right now is like stripping away all of those wow. shoulds. Um, for myself, but also hopefully as I do for myself, somehow along the way helping others to strip away those pieces too. You have to promise me in the next four months. I know you're gonna be on tour I'm, soon. We'll do it. We'll do I'm it. Totally I'll set down. it up for you if okay, you want. Okay, let's do it. I'll, you can invite you're chanting your, with me then. I'll chant with you. Okay, bro. I'll be in the back row, but yes, I'll be. I'll be, I'm not, I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> come on. No, seriously, I think it'd be powerful even just to do it once to like see and just create your own little one hour like chanting session. I love the universe. This is the universe. I think so, you got to do it. Two days ago was the first time I ever chanted in front of someone, and now Gosh, look at what let's I'm do doing. Do this. <laughs> chanting with Leon Rhymes. It's gonna be a whole Spotify playlist. <laughs> totally. You can create meditations for people. I'm I've been, this could be your level of service to give give back. I literally away. in the last forty eight hours have gone through this. I, I, it came to me in meditation today, I what I it. wanted to create. I see it. We're here for You're a reason. You're on the same wavelength. I, I see it. it. <laughs> I'm going to support. <laughs> Thank you. What is the, uh, the, now you went through like a public, you were, this is your second marriage, right? You went through, yes. you were married for a, about a decade, is that what it was? Or? Um, seven years. Seven yeah. years. And now you've been remarried mm -hmm. for a while now. What's the greatest lesson you learned in the, the relationship or the marriage that didn't work out? And what's the greatest lesson that you're, you've learned in this current marriage? I think I've learned as a whole um, that people were all here to teach each other something. Um, my first husband, I'm incredibly grateful for everything we both taught each other. Yeah. And we were fantastic friends and um, super uber close as friends. Today. And uh, no, you not were. today. You were. You were. You were. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. Yeah. I mean, you were then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who knows what the future holds? But um, sure. we were then, and uh, I think with everything that happened, obviously there had to be a lot of separation there sure. then for people to heal. Um, but I, I realized what we were for each other and how we 
how what we taught each other and and I'm very very grateful for that so mm -hmm. I don't I think the the easiest thing to do is look back and blame and you know say oh my god I wish that never happened and all of those things and I think for me uh, I totally see why like I'm very aware of it all um, and the biggest lesson for me in the learning how to handle relationship first off like I mean I just yeah I you never know how love is going to come at you where it's going to hit you <laughs> how you're going to react to it yeah. um, and I really uh, I've I've learned to I've learned to speak truth I think more into my relationships um, to know that I can be okay alone, um, all of those sorts of things. I think those are really powerful to have. As I mean, like I was saying earlier, there was I was always around someone. There was mm -hmm. like someone always around me. You were never alone. No, never alone. I was never like out of a relationship in that way of you know living alone and that kind of thing. So um, I now know like that's those are things I'm fully capable of. Um, but the my latest relationship, you know, with, with Eddie, hopefully my only one, I'd say my latest, but <laughs> no, um, with Eddie, it's been quite the ride because we went through so much publicly together. Um, we've had, you know, to blend a family, you know, I have two stepsons that are 11 and 15. Um, he's taught me a lot. They've all taught me a lot. And that's one of those Who's things. Who's taught you more, your husband or your stepkids? Oh, wow both in completely different ways and i'll actually have to say um my husband's ex-wife has taught me a lot too really uh you know it's one of those things where <laughs> you all want to hate each other at the beginning and then like i said there's these gifts that i've realized that are right in front of me that don't look like gifts but are yeah um which is this whole situation of uh so much so many things i've learned from um from the ego falling away to people you know that you still love you, hate you, and you're like, first off, you're just a gut wrench of, you know, when you're depending on that yeah. kind of outside love. And then you realize it's the best gift that could have ever happened to you. And then you realize like having to, having to make amends with people and having to blend personalities that are not gelling and um, having to extend love in places mm. where you never thought you'd have to extend love. Like where? Um, like just to people, you know, when you've all hurt each other like so much and then you all continue to just like hurt each other, um, having to get past all of that and finally extend love. Like that's been the most, the hugest just weight off my back, I think, is to know, to come into this uh, realization um, that we all are gifts to one another. Yeah. You know, even my parents, where I've wanted to blame them in the past, like realizing that was a gift also. Like all of these things are true gifts. And like they, when you start to really love who you are and you realize like, oh, these are all the things that created me. Like, you mm. know, um, you really do have to, you can't look at it any other way. Um, so yeah, they've, we've all taught each other. I know we're, we're all in each other's lives for a reason. Um, and it's still a challenge. Um, but it's one that I'm definitely, I have such a different perception on than when I first stepped yeah. into this. Wow. And my husband's amazing. He really is. He is, he's loved me through a lot of pain. And I've always felt that people run away from it. You know, I've always, I've always thought there was something wrong with me. Like I have all this trauma and I'm in so much pain that I, the people, I, I can't show the side of me to people because they run away. Um, wow. And I've always you can't show the pain. I can't show the pain. People can't take it. So you would hide it, or you would. I would hide it, and uh, he was just always been someone that I could. He's been there through it all, and um, he's never turned away from me. And it's such a wow. he's such a blessing. I mean, I I still can't believe it. I still test him at times. Still, I mean, <laughs> throw something at him every yes, now and then. Yes, and I'm like, wait, but you still stayed again? No, I mean, it's it. I think it's just when I felt I felt so abandoned at times in my life so early on that there's been that wound. And wow. so I didn't believe that he existed. <laughs> I was still, I'm like, wait, you really do exist. Like you're, he's been, he's been in it with me. Wow. And, um, he is a true, true blessing. Sounds like a special guy. He is a good dude. That's he really amazing. Is. That's yeah. amazing. Have you been able to heal, um, your experience with your parents? 
once again we talk about layers um yes yes i have a certain and, level yes to a certain level absolutely um and you know the hardest thing is i think uh on this journey for me has been getting to a certain point and you know anybody in your life whether it's your parents or you want to bring them along with you and mm -hmm. you want to like help them and you know you can't do that unless people want to change to, yeah. To do. yeah and um sometimes we just don't see eye to eye and that's been i think we've healed a lot of the past and it's the it's the present that i am so desiring for them to be happy and have joy in their life and all of these things that i've now been able to feel and overcome the places that they've been in and so sometimes i think that's now the hard part for me mm, to surrender to that yeah to let it, that's to my not. that's the next level for me is oh, surrendering that. wow <laughs> and just loving i mean that's a thing you know with with everyone in your life um and this is something my husband has taught me is loving people in the place that they're at and not expecting them to change and he's he's done that for me and That's i think hard. it is it's hard because i don't do it for myself you know i'm constantly i'm it's very difficult for me to love myself sometimes in the places that are really that I don't want that i don't want to show or that i don't like and i'm finding that when i start to really become tender with those places then i become a lot more tender yeah. with everyone else around yeah. me wow you know? wow you're like, wait, where are we? There's so much I want to talk about <laughs> with you. And we only have a limited time That's left, okay. so I want to make sure we, we cover a few other things because there's I think there's so many layers I'd love to dive into mm -hmm. about that, but maybe we'll get you back on yeah, next, next year to. for like... When I, the, when I figured some more stuff out <laughs> next year, <Exactly. laughs> I'll um, come back. I, I'm curious about this side of things because there's, there's a lot of musicians and uh, uh, actors and dancers who listen to the show. Mm -hmm. Um, those who are trying to make it in their art and their craft and I think a lot of them struggle with one making it and then the second thing is once they make it how do I stay relevant yeah. how do I keep making it how do I not be like a hit for a few years and then fade away how have you dealt with this because you had you know success for so long and you still have a lot of success mm -hmm. but do you struggle with trying to stay relevant where there's always a new artist and people, new sounds, and do you feel like you have that pressure? Or how do you overcome the pressure of being relevant constantly? Yes and no. I, feel, I mean, I, of course, there's always that pressure in a career. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't look at it as more as relevant as I do as how can I, how can I keep creating and still being interesting, you know? Um, interesting to other people? Both. or I know what you're about to say that. <laughs> Both. And I, I think when you start to focus on what's interesting to me, um, look, when you start to pull yourself out of the, the what, what everyone else thinks is relevant and how to play the game, uh -huh. um, you're going to get some pushback and you're going to maybe have things that aren't as successful commercially. Um, but then what did you get from it? Mm -hmm. Like, how did it make, that's where I had to shift things. How did it make me feel? Did I really enjoy this process this time around? Did I not cut songs to please other people and really did things that I love to do? Um, where am I singing from? Is this coming from my heart? Is it mm -hmm. coming from the need to be relevant? Like, I think these are questions that I constantly am asking myself. To of, make a hit, to yeah, you know, whatever, sell um, records or whatever. And yeah. the, when you start, focusing on that like it's just a race that's just it's, never gonna win yeah you never are and so um i keep coming back to this place of what what feels good to me now um i mean granted i'm in a position where i can do that yeah um, you still get a lot of opportunities no matter what you're doing right you're yeah getting... but i still when i was younger um so i started on country music and then i my record label released my first pop hit, which was How Do I Live, and uh, to pop radio. And at the time, no so one... Is Coyote Ugly Time? No, that? that was after this. This okay, is yeah. How Do I Live was the first one. It was one. a huge hit. Yeah, I can't find the, the moment. Slow, was huge. The slow, slow yeah, How Do I Live, yeah, was, was the first hit. one. Mega. Yeah. yeah, so, um, and I, at the time, like, no one really crossed over. Mm. It was... From it country was, to pop. Yeah, like, yeah. that was a no-no, because it now was like, it was kind of a it. band. Yeah, people do it all the time. 
back then it was like people were kind of abandoning mm. the format. I was 14, keep in mind. I'm like, You're like I'm just trying wait, to... I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just trying to enjoy music. Like I didn't, you know, there was no real, yeah. I didn't have no idea that that, anything like that it was would a bad happen. Thing, yeah, yeah, it was a bad thing. Um, so even, I think ever since that happened, I just loved music. And for me, it was like, wait, why is someone trying to put me in a box? And so I really mm -hmm. rebelled against that my mm -hmm. whole life of like constantly like pushing on the walls of every box that anyone could put me in. And... Maybe that was the reason why I stayed relevant. Mm. Maybe it was the reason why people were, you know, constantly wanting to hear what I was doing because it was different, a little bit different every time. And um, but I think the one thing that people always connected with, with me was that I connected with my heart, and my heart came through my music. And I think that that's really what people connected with. I'm finding that more now than ever. Of like, oh wait, the voice is just like the avenue of the other gift that's like underneath it you know and yeah. so when i talk about pulling back the layers of like unwrapping this gift that i've had it's like i'm i'm really now just discovering like that the voice is just kind of the the surface of mm -hmm. what else is underneath it yeah. and um i think really connecting we're we live in a world where we all try to fit in it's like the worst thing we can possibly do for ourselves um you know, I remember a time in my life when I'm in my mid-teens where I just, I wanted to be normal so bad. You wanted to fit in. I wanted to be, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be normal so bad. It's like the worst thing I could have asked for. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Um, because you do, you lose these unique pieces of yourself and we all are so unique. And we, we can, I can easily get into thinking this. I started a blog called Soul of Everly. And, um, Soul of Everly. Soul of Everly, yeah. E-V-E-R-L-E. And, um. I, when I started the blog, I was like, why am I starting? Everybody says, it's, 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 it's Everyone's got a blog, like uh -huh. the whole deal, and it's so easy to get into thinking like, oh, everyone's doing this kind of music, or there's so many people doing that or making that product. But the thing is, we all have such a unique way of seeing things and a unique way of being and creating, and we can't think that way. Like, it, that's just so not true. Yeah. We there's There are people out there that need your truth in the way that you present it and, um, and your creations, and so, I think that's been a big lesson for me is to just continue to create mm -hmm. without expectation um, and for the joy of it. I think that's one thing I lost for a while because I was, you start focusing on the business side of it and you lose the joy. Um, it's really, really, con really connecting with yourself. Yeah. I think your intuition, man, my intuition tells me to do some things sometimes where I'm like, F -f really? Like, <laughs> you want me to <laughs> create that? that? Yeah. I should do that now? I mean, I'm going through that right now. I'm actually starting to work on a new record. And I've been sitting with it for about a year now because it's like one piece of me will pull me one way. The other piece of me will pull me that way. My intuition will pull me that way. And wow. I'm like, wait, <laughs> which one am I? Which one? I had to start discerning, like, which one really is the intuition and, right. and rolling with it because it's, it's risky, it's scary. It is it's... risky, and it's also fun. Like, what I'm now realizing, like, I'm having fun doing that, and that's yeah. probably where I should be going, you know? Instead More of... into that, yeah. Yeah. I think your greatest hits are ahead of you, still. Thanks. I think it's, you know, in, in all areas Enchanting. of your life. Enchanting. Enchanting <laughs> in music, in relationships, in, you know, the message you have for the world. I think your level of service is just beginning, and uh, I'm really excited to see what you're going to create, Thank whatever you. your intuition tells you to do. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. Uh, this is a question. I would, uh, gosh, I want to have you come back on another time, yes, but I want to respect your time. <laughs> um, this is a question I ask at the end. It's called the three truths. I'm going to ask you in a different way. Uh oh, okay. So imagine you've sung every song you've wanted to sing. You've created every piece of music. It's all been out there. All your weird, intuitive ways that you've gone into, you've made the music you wanted right. to. Right. For whatever reason, you've got to take all your music with you. And this is your last day. Many years from now, and you choose the last day for your life. Mm -hmm. But you've done it all. All the crazy dreams, it's all happened. Okay. You've impacted the world you want to, the way you want to. Okay. You've loved deeply, all that stuff. Um, but your music's got to go with you. So no one has access to it anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't listen to it anymore. But you've got a microphone connected to you right now. And the whole world puts headphones on. Everyone in the world gets to listen to you one last time. And you get to share three truths, the three lessons 
that you would share with the world that they would have to remember you by and to have access to? What would you say with your voice while everyone is listening? Dude, this is like intense. <laughs> it's called the School of Greatness. This is so good. So again, everyone's putting on headphones right now. Seven plus billion people. And you got to share three things you know to be true about your life's experience that you would share these lessons with the world. We're putting on the headphones. We're about to listen. Leanne Rhymes comes on <laughs> the mic. What would you say? Wow. That's, this is really difficult. Um, to the best of your abilities. Yeah, no, o this is... On the, off the cuff. Well, yeah, no, I, I would definitely... Um, the most painful thing you'll ever experience in your life is the closing of your heart. And you will know... <clears throat> When you've closed it, you will know when you've opened it because it will feel like you just started breathing again. Ooh. And you're going to make me cry. This is wow. so true, though. Because wow. um, I oscillate between the two all the time. I think yeah. we all do. Yeah. But when you've really closed it and it opens, like it's just so powerful. Yeah. Um, so that would be the first thing is to... Uh, as much as you can in this lifetime, try to keep your heart open. Yeah. Um, what else? Number one. That's number, number two. one. Um, wow. Uh, number two, um, we are, there's so much power in us that we have barely touched on. Um, we have the power to change anything about ourselves. Um, and I think for me, what I've learned is that it is, it comes in the form of creativity. I think we don't give ourselves enough, uh, we don't give ourselves enough credit for the creative beings that we are. Mm -hmm. um, we look too much to the outside and don't find, uh, don't connect enough with the inside. Yeah. And in, in that connection, what I found going to intuition is that usually the first thing that comes to mind, like I, I was sitting here thinking about like a zillion things I could say, but I'm like, okay, heart, Yeah. you know, the intuition, like go to these things. The first thing that comes is like, okay, I need to speak on that. Um, the first thing that comes, go with it. You might not know where you're going, but go with it yeah. because there's such a plan, so bigger, so much bigger than us than we could ever ever fathom yeah so even the smallest of choices um every little thing we do falls into that plan i mm. truly believe that mm. um so yes intuition that's definitely. two yes okay. and number three the world is listening number three <laughs> there is a god <laughs> which i do believe yeah. um this this energy that that creates us is just an amazing thing but uh, let me see i don't know if that would be number three but yes that is definitely it's definitely there um number three i know we talk about self-love a lot um it's become like this kind of mm -hmm. like buzzword or this buzz phrase um but true self-love is the key to life in my opinion um because what is that saying you can only meet someone as far as you can meet yourself mm -hmm. and so the deeper i find the ten the more the, the tender i get with myself um the more that i can sit with all the facets of me and truly be with those things the more i can serve the world in that way yeah so i think for me self-love is is key yeah wow those are powerful thanks <laughs> that's a difficult that's probably one of the most difficult things i've ever done because there's, there's so good. much there's so much there so really much. is so much i'm curious i've got a couple final ones um this just popped up for me what was the hardest year of your teenage years what what year was like the worst year for you? They all ran into each other at one point. They seemed like one long year. Um, probably 17. 17. Yeah. If your 17 year old self was right in front of you right now, 
going through that and you had something you could say to her, oh, I, what would you say? The first thing that came to mind was fall apart. Like, you don't have to hold up the world for everybody else. It's okay. Wow. Yeah, everybody else can take care of themselves. Wow, I like that. Yeah. You've got uh, a movie coming out right now. What's the movie? The movie's called It's Christmas Eve. It's Christmas it's Eve. It's on Hallmark Channel. I just did a Christmas movie um, for them. I wrote three original songs for the film, um, which there's a soundtrack that's out right now also. Uh, I executive produced the film. Wow. From the ground up. Had so much fun doing this movie. Um, there's a lot of heart in it. Of course, it's Hallmark. There's a beautiful sure. love story. And, it's always um, good Christmas movies out there. Is. You know, there's always good stuff. I'm excited to watch it. It is. So, yeah. So, it's Please on the Hallmark it channel. Yes, They're November playing, 10th. November 10th yes. through the Christmas season. Through the Christmas season, yes. They'll be playing it every few days, I'm assuming. Yeah. But you can search on your DVR or whatever to find yes, out when please. it's happening. Watch it. Take a screenshot. Post it on Instagram. Yes, Share please. it with your friends. Let us know you're watching it. Uh, what's the title of it again? It's Christmas, comma, Eve. It's Christmas Eve. Eve. Mm, it's, <laughs> Eve. We're fancy. Eve. <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. Watch it. Share it. Tag Leanne as well. Um, <clears throat> The music is out. They can where can they get the music? Spotify, um, you can go. ITunes. Yeah, I mean everywhere. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Stream it everywhere. Um, Hallmark.com, LeanRhymesChristmas.com. Wow. Actually, I have a Christmas website. Isn't it? Wow. LeanRhymesChristmas.com. <laughs> Christmas.com. Yes. And you're going on tour this. Yes. For how long? Uh, we're on tour for like three weeks, basically. Um, this is our sixth holiday tour, and uh, it's really fun. Um, we're, I want to hear you sing "Oh Holy Night." Okay. Do you do it at your tour? I or no? don't. Silent Night. But I don't do either of those, but if you come to a show, maybe you'll do Saturday night. I'll for sure do one or the other. Yes, you got it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. But we're playing the West Coast this year. We pick a kind of a place in the United mm -hmm. States to play every year, and we're doing the West Coast again. We we did that a few years ago. So okay. Yeah. West Coast. So we West can go Coast. LeanRhymes.com to see the tour dates. I'm assuming. LeanRhymesWorld.com. LeanRhymesWorld.com or on Instagram. I'm sure there's. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. Leanne Rhymes on you there. You can't miss us. Um, <laughs> what else? We got the movie. It's Christmas, comma Eve. The music. <laughs> Music, the tour, yes. social media, you hang out on Instagram a lot, Twitter. I do, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely on Instagram. Um, and then uh, soulofeverly.com. Soulofeverly.com dot com is the website. We'll have it all linked yes. up. How often are you blogging or sharing? I usually blog um, like t once or twice a week. Mm. And then uh, I do a little thing called Chalk Talk, which I put up mm. either a quote that I've written or some of my favorite ones and kind of expand on it. Um, yeah, it's very, very soulful, obviously Soul of Beverly, very soulful um, little place for me to play around. Mm -hmm. So it's just right. kind of an extension of, of my music, but in a completely different way. Check out all yeah. this stuff. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Leanne, for being a, more than just a beautiful voice, but a beautiful soul. Thank because you. you've gone through so much in your life, in your career, and relationships publicly, and I can only imagine the amount of stress anxiety and overwhelm that could cause someone and for you to continue to show up with a beautiful voice and a beautiful soul and Thanks. and give to the world the way you do is just it's a breath of fresh air so thank I really you. acknowledge you for your kindness your generosity thank you. our friendship and, and, and everything and, and the greatest hits that are still coming thank you so I acknowledge you for all that and um, thank you for being so you're just so kind and open and yeah. just it's so wonderful to be on here of course yeah of course. I appreciate it the final question is, what's your definition of greatness? What's my definition of greatness? Wow. Um, I would think I would go with this. I would, for me, it's, it's someone who is willing to take risks. It's someone who's willing to fail. It's someone who realizes that failing is not the end of the world, that it's only a stepping stone to success. Um, it's someone who keeps persevering mm. and learning from every bump in the road um, only to come out of that with more wisdom and knowledge of, of uh, a clear vision of where they want to go. So it's, yeah, it's uh, someone who doesn't give up. 